Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, we're so happy to have you join us today. My name is Carol Cohn and I'm the director of the Consortium on Gender, Security and Human Rights, which is based at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And it is my privilege to welcome you to today's webinar on gender, race and climate justice, national and global policy perspectives which I am delighted to say is our first joint event with the UMass Boston Sustainable Solutions Lab, which is directed by Rebecca Hurst. And just before I turn to her, I wanna mention that while we're introducing this webinar, it would be wonderful if you in the audience might wanna introduce yourselves in the chat box, let us know who you are. And after the introduction, the chat box will be off until the last few minutes of the webinar. So please, um, talk to us in the meantime. Okay, so Rebecca, let me turn this over to you. Everyone, welcome. Um, as Carol said, my name is Rebecca Hurst and I'm the director of the Sustainable Solutions Lab at UMass Boston. We are a research institute focused on issues of climate justice. So really excited to be here with you all today and to be partnering on this event. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> um, just so that you all know what to expect, this webinar is scheduled for two hours. First, the panelists will be offering um, opening remarks of about 10 minutes each. Then we'll have about 45 minutes during which the panel moderator will pose several rounds of questions to the panelists. Then we will turn to questions gathered from the audience. So if you'd like to submit questions for the panelists, please do so using the Q&A function and you can do that all the way through the event. Um, and then at the very end, each panelist will have a brief time for a closing reflection. Um, please also note that when you leave the webinar, you will get a, um, a pop-up survey um, about the event, and we'd be very grateful if you could take just a couple of minutes to fill it out. Finally, you should know that this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available online at our website and YouTube channel if you want to share it with other people. Um, as you all know from doing many other events, no doubt, in addition to the generosity of our speakers and sharing their time with us, an event like this cannot happen without many different kinds of support. For today's panel, in addition to our joint hosting with the Sustainable Solutions Lab, our appreciation and thanks go out to the UMass Boston Departments of Anthropology, Communications, Conflict Resolution, Human Security and Global Governance, economics, history, philosophy, political science, and women's gender and sexuality studies, as well as the human rights minor, the Honors College, and the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development. We thank all of them for their support. I'd also like to thank the consortium's staff and terrific interns who worked very hard to prepare today's event, including Casey, Katie Rose Parsons, Taylor Douglas, Laura Nishimuta, and Vera Schroeder, and my special thanks to Melissa Kay, our project manager, who not only dealt with all the practical aspects of organizing this, but also deserves the lion's share of credit for the intellectual work of conceptualizing, researching and designing this spring's webinar series. Before I turn things over to our moderator for today's panel, I'd like to take a moment for a land, labor and life acknowledgement which I also want to acknowledge um, has in no small measure been influenced by the thoughtful model provided by UMass Boston professor Sindiso Manisi Weeks. It's central to our understanding of what the consortium's work is all about to acknowledge the land upon which the University of Massachusetts Boston resides as an honoring of indigenous people's relationships with their traditional territories and as a recognition of the ongoing colonial violence against both these peoples and their territories. UMass Boston and its surrounding communities are based on the ancestral homelands of the Massachusett, Pawtucket and Nipmuc people. We want to acknowledge the violent history of genocide and forced removal from this territory and honor the diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land. We also want to note that land acknowledgements are just one small step and need to be followed by gaining more knowledge by, and by action building solidarity and combating the ongoing structural and physical violence directed toward indigenous peoples. And I'll note that Northwestern University's Native American and Indigenous Initiatives website has a lot of really good resources for thinking about what comes after land acknowledgements. 
Also, following Sindiso, I want to acknowledge that this country, like many others, has been built on the enslaved labor of black and brown people. And the physical and cultural violence and white supremacy underpinning that system are ever present in this country today, as we are reminded of daily. And finally, especially in this time of pandemic and so-called nativist politics, itself a problematic term, I also want to honor the contributions of waves of immigrants who came and daily come to this country as a free choice when often it's the violence, poverty, and environmental degradation in their home countries hewn through hundreds of years of colonial and, and imperial relationships that have left them little other choice but to leave. All of these populations have not only long faced structural racism and physical and structural violence, but also epistemological violence. That is the attack on their knowledges, their skills, their values and worldviews as inadequate, primitive, inferior, just plain wrong, something to be shed in the name of progress. The consortium's um, symposium that we had this past October on confronting the climate crisis and our webinar series this spring are in part a response to that attempted erasure and an acknowledgement that the colonial, racist, patriarchal, capitalist knowledges, paradigms, and policies that led us to the brink of climate and eco-catastrophe are not going to be providing the solutions. So today's panel on gender, race, and climate justice, national and global policy perspectives is the second in our four-part series on the prospects for sustainable peace at the nexus of race, gender, and the climate crisis. The first one on Black feminist ecological perspectives was absolutely wonderful. And if you missed it, you can find the video on the consortium's website. And we hope you'll also be able to join us for the next two webinars. The URL for details about the topics, speakers and their talks, as well as the registration links can be found in the chat box. Now, at last, it is a great privilege for me to turn this over to Francis Roberts Gregory, who was a panelist in the Black Feminist Ecological Perspectives webinar and will moderate today's panel. She is an eco-womanist ethnographer and feminist political ecologist, currently serving as a future faculty fellow at Northeastern University in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. And she's also a co-founding member of the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal, as well as former environmental educator for the Deep South Center for en Environmental Justice. So Francis, please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Carol, for that wonderful introduction. It is a honor and pleasure to moderate today's uh, discussion and also to be in the company of such amazing individuals who are really dedicated to the intersection of racial and climate justice and gender justice, I should say. And so, I would also like to mention that today's conversation really builds off of our conversation a few weeks ago, which as Carol mentioned, focused on black feminist ecological thought. In that conversation, we actually lifted up a lot of the great work of many of the panelists today. So I'm so excited to go deeper into some of their views on how we actually imagine more equitable and just futures. So to begin, we have Colette Pichon Battle, who is the executive director of the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. So it is an honor to introduce Colette. I do know her well. And so she is the founder and executive director of the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy and develops programming focused on equitable disaster recovery, global migration, community economic development, climate justice and energy democracy. She also supports the Gulf South for a Green New Deal initiative. Colette works with local communities, national funders, and elected officials in the post-Katrina, post-BP disaster recovery, and was a lead coordinator for Gulf South Rising 2015. And this was a regional initiative around climate justice and a just transition in the South. In addition to developing advocacy initiatives that intersect with race, systems of power, and ecology, Colette manages the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy's legal services in immigration law and disaster law. In 2018, Colette joined the Movement for Black Lives Policy Table Leadership Team, leading to advanced national work on climate justice. Finally, I must... Uh, let you all know that Colette is a 2019 Obama Fellow and a 2019 TED Fellow. In 2018, Colette was awarded an honorary doctorate from Kenyon College, and in 2016, she was named a White House Champion of Change for Climate Equity. 
In 2015, she was selected as an Echoing Green Climate Fellow and has received numerous awards from the state of Louisiana, the American Bar Association, and others for her work in disaster recovery. Let's all welcome Colette. Thank you so much, Francis. I appreciate that. Um, it's been a long haul uh, to get into this work and, and sometimes just hearing a, a reminder of, of what we build is, is really helpful. Thank you so much for that introduction. I wanna offer gratitude um, to Carol, to Rebecca, to Melissa for this invitation, for the work that so many women are doing behind the scenes to make this conference go. We see your labor and we appreciate it. And thank you for thinking of me. I also want to offer peace to the Choctaw Nation on whose traditional lands I'm calling in from today in Southeast Louisiana um, and gratitude for that acknowledgement that Carol did. Um, it's great to see our institutions um, taking uh, land sovereignty and indigenous sovereignty seriously. So thank you for that leadership. Um, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit today about my, uh, my trajectory into this work, uh, which stems from Hurricane Katrina and now land squarely um, in a Biden administration uh, that is prioritizing climate change. It's been a 15 year journey um, to really understand not just what the climate reality is, the science, uh, the impacts, um, but to really understand what this new climate reality means for communities on the front line, means for the South, means for black and poor communities across this country and other countries around the globe. Um, it has been a journey. Uh, my, my background is not one of um, understanding deep political thought of, of other places or um, organizing training from all of the greats. Um, my start really uh, began um, looking around at the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama after Hurricane Katrina and watching what kind of damage could come from such a large storm uh, that packed such a big punch. Um, I began to pay attention to the shifts and the changes of something that felt very normal to me as someone who grew up in South Louisiana. We have tropical storms every year. Hurricanes are what I know and grow up with, uh, but this one was different. And I think it really brought in uh, a new era of climate uh, disaster and understanding that those normal things that we see, hurricanes, rain, even heat are now exacerbated by a new climate reality. I started thinking about disaster recovery more than anything, but in 2010, with the BP oil drilling disaster, I be began to connect the dots. Katrina was the impact of the drilling that we saw in the BP oil drilling disaster. Um, that, that high level fracking in deep ocean water um, that put not only the lives of the 11 uh, workers that we lost, but also the lives of fisher folk and people who depend on our oceans uh, the lives of many marine animals um, at stake, uh, and really starting to understand that it is our economy, it is uh, what we consume in our economy, and how we extract uh, fossil fuels and dirty fuels from our earth that are driving uh, moments like Hurricane Katrina. So since then I was in. Um, everything I thought I knew, I, I left it to the side, and I began a process of understanding that we have got to see this climate crisis as something that permeates every single justice issue that anybody's working on. We've got to understand what this means for communities, not just those who have the resources to get out of the way or to evacuate um, or to even recover, but what this means for folks who are uh, system systematically marginalized, targeted, and left out of the ability to make their own decisions um, and care for themselves. So this of course became um, an understanding around economics, housing, jobs, education, um, policing, jails, criminal justice. Uh, this was a hard 15 years of learning, but if there's anything I could leave folks with today, it is understanding that every single issue connects to the climate crisis. And what did I see that shocked me the most? It was really the role of women and black women in particular um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil drilling disaster and the subsequent storms. Who's holding these communities together? Who do people look to for information? Who needs to understand what's happening so that they can disseminate information so folks can make decisions for themselves? It's black women, most of all. Uh, even in this COVID pandemic, you know, who was making sure folks had food? 
who was making sure babies had something to eat and clothes and diapers. It was black women across the South in particular who are making sure that community is okay. This is something that we see in disaster and it's something we have to understand in climate disaster, the role of women, the role of women of color, especially in disaster recovery or in disaster response. But it's also that recovery piece that really um, uh, made me understand my role as a black woman from South Louisiana in this conversation. To watch hundreds of black women across the South react to floodwaters, know how to clean things up without toxic chemicals, know how to feed themselves, know how to catch their own water and make their own food. These are the things that we're gonna need to survive this climate reality. And these are the things that I learned to, to really honor and, and lift up. And so this comes with a whole other learning. I had to learn about parts per million. I had to learn about molecules warming and growing. I had to learn about all of these things. And I really wanna encourage folks to take the time to learn the climate science. But there's another piece to this fight and it has to do with our spirit, with our soul and with our culture. And women are the culture bearers in many of these communities, especially the intact communities of the South. And I would just point to that role because as we go through trauma after trauma after trauma, we will see and some at some point admit that it is our culture and traditions that will get most people through, especially when they don't have access to mental health care, when they don't have access to other health items, um, it's going to be these cultural pieces of knowledge. It's gonna be these cultural processes that really get people through to the next day. I'll mention, um, you know, just around preparedness um, and, and recovery and response, there are gender considerations that people need to have in mind. You know, a big hurricane comes and if you can evacuate, you do, but not everyone has the same rights in evacuation. Oftentimes we see mothers with children who are um, not allowed to come into certain uh, facilities because they have too many quote children and our transgender family faces an even bigger uh, fight much like our immigrant communities because they're often asked to provide identification that might not match their biological, uh, that might not match who they are right now. Um, and then sometimes turned away because they don't have a gender that has been assigned to these stations. These are the things we have to think about because this is the reality happening now. And these are the pieces of uh, the gender conversation that get left out of disaster response. I'll just, uh, you know, wrap up by saying um, the Biden administration you know, I, I suppose we should be happy. So let me, let me offer some joy. Um, we do not have someone trying to kill us in the White House. That's great. But we need something more than just not someone trying to kill us. We need someone who is going to be bold enough to call, uh, call the truth and to address the root causes. We are dealing right now with the realities of an economic system that is rooted in extraction. We are dealing with the realities of, uh, of, capital, of uh, racialized capitalism that has brought us to the brink of global imbalance. We are dealing right now with a prioritization of corporations over people to the point where we're willing to sacrifice the planet for the benefit of 12 corporations who can be traced to the problem. As a lawyer, I'll just say, you know, this is clear causation and we should maybe think about accountability the other way. We should maybe take the time to stand up for the people and the planet and make these corporations pay what they need to pay. And by the way, the United States is not out of that picture either. We are a nation who is, um, you know, at the brink, uh, at the forefront of this imbalance. And we have to make sure that we pay our fair share as folks prepare for this climate reality around the planet. Um, this is a conversation about science. This is a conversation about how communities adapt to the storms and the things that are coming. This is a conversation about how we think about a new future. But this is mostly a conversation about accountability. This is mostly a conversation about democracy and what it means for folks to engage and build the kind of government that will, that will push forward the standards that we need in order to actually achieve what is necessary for us to survive. It's not gonna be the people in power I'm not even sure it's gonna be the men. Maybe it will be, let me not count them all out. But I do put a lot of hope in the women and female leadership that we see stepping up, especially this next generation. They are strong, they are courageous, they are powerful, and they are calling the truth to all levels of power, including our own uh, individual uh, community power structures that also have to be dealt with. If we're gonna deal with this climate crisis using a feminist lens, 
We're going to have to dismantle the structure that exists right now. And we're gonna to have to rebuild not a replica, but something completely different. If we were to think about the sort of obelisk uh, standards of, of, of the monuments uh, versus uh, the circle, um, I would say it's time for us to build more circles. It's time for us to conjure the feminine, the sacred feminine, and it's time for us to really take a stand for this planet, for Mother Earth, for all of the mothers, for all of the women who will not be mothers, uh, but to really take a stand for what we need to survive. I look forward to the questions and the conversation today. Um, it's an honor to be here. And I'm really excited um, that A Voice from the South gets to be a part of this national and global conversation. Thank you, Francis. No, thank you, Colette. What a beautiful offering to the space. That was wonderful. I think we all gained something from that. Well, at this time, I would like to uh, move on to our second panelist. And also, I would want it to acknowledge that I'm currently also in Louisiana, um, in New Orleans, also known as Bobancha. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that as well. So let's bring on Jackie. So Jacqueline Patterson is the director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Jackie has served as a coordinator and co-founder of the Women of Color United. Jackie Patterson has worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. She served as a senior women's right policy analyst for Action Aid, where she integrated a women's right lens for the issue of food rights, macroeconomics, and climate change, as well as the intersection of violence against women and HIV and AIDS. Previously, she served as an assistant vice president of HIV AIDS programs for IMA World Health, World Health providing management and technical assistance to medical facilities and programs in 23 countries in Africa and the Caribbean. Jackie also has many publications and articles, I won't name them all, but they include Climate Change is a Civil Rights Issue, Gulf Oil Drilling Disaster Gendered Layers of Impact, Just Energy Policies Reducing Pollution Creating Jobs, and a book chapter, Equity and Disaster, Civil and Human Rights Challenges in the Context of Emergency Events. I'm really excited about this upcoming chapter in Building Community Resilience Post-Disaster and the chapter at the intersections in the recent anthology, All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. So at this time, let's please welcome Jackie, who's also someone I deeply admire. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. And I'm honored to share this stage with my co-panelists. I'm honored to be moderated by my dear friend, Francis. And um, thank you so much to Carol and to Melissa and to Rebecca. Melissa took um, Athenian, not Herculean, efforts to uh, contact me um, for all the different things that I was delinquent on consistently throughout the entire lead up to this panel. So <laughs> special thanks to Melissa for her uh, grace through it all. So um, again, my name is Jackie Patterson, and I am um, uh, excited to be here with you all. I'm, I'm from um, Florida, where I'm on um, unceded Seminole territory. I live in Bal Baltimore on unceded uh, Piscataway territory. And so, and I also wanted to also just really give thanks for the uh, land acknowledgement and other uh, historic uh, oppression acknowledgements that, that Carol gave. That was. I was kind of making notes and thinking I would like to integrate some of those um, that, that language into uh, our, our uh, future events. So I, I was I, I'm, I'm I was thrilled to be able to talk about this topic and touched to be able to talk about this topic. I um my relationship with this intersection, gender, race, and climate began before. I even knew, um, and, and, and this past uh, October, after being at home for the COVID-19 um, situation, the first time that I left home was to get in my car and drive to Dublin, Mississippi, which is the unincorporated area where my mom was born. And my mom passed away in 2013, and last year would have been her 80th birthday. And I, I wanted to go there to really pay homage to, to the, the life and the legacy of my mom in a way that I feel like I didn't appreciate when she was 
here, you know, I, I, I want to kind of generalize and say that that people take a, take take their parents for granted. But anyway, <laughs> I, I can get into all that. But I um, but I I I, uh, I really just did want to walk the land where she was born and truly appreciate the legacy and the light. And in so doing, I actually looked up her, the census record for the year that she was born and was struck by looking at, um, looking at my great grandmother and my grandmother and my mom and her siblings, uh, all female household and was just struck when, when I was there uh, walking around the, the neighborhood and, and there was this vast cotton field right across the way from where from, from there, and I wondered, you know, if, if my ancestors, you know, the, what was that the actual land that they that they were working when they were, um, when at that time, and I and I at the time when we were thinking about um, essential workers, I was really struck by this work that was considered to be essential, but yet the workers, um, the people who were working the land, weren't, um, and it just the, this, this theme of kind of, as, as Sister Colette was saying, of exploitation and, um, and extraction um, was really just sitting with me as I walked that land. And I thought about how people, women were working that land and having to have their babies as they were picking cotton and then throw their babies on their back and continue the work for the day. And, um, and again, this notion of kind of doing essential work, but not being deemed as uh, essential as, as people. And, um, and so from there, I, uh, I, I went from that area in Dublin, Mississippi to an un another un unincorporated area called Sand Branch, Texas, where again, all, there were a number of families that I visited with female headed households with black women and um, and Sandbridge is a place that's never had running water in the history of, of that community. And it's a freedman settlement. Um, and I was again struck by, by, by a, people who were considered to be disposable, just not even being regarded. Um, I also was, when I was there, I, the, we were talking about the people who weren't there there, there had been a FEMA buyout situation where the area was declared to be a floodplain, even though it was settled in 1865 and there's never been a flood there. And there were um, households who, where they, um, they, were push, they were pushed into to selling because they didn't have running water, they don't have services because the fact that it was declared a floodplain gave them the excuse to not provide um, services there. And, um, and so when people were being pushed to, to, to sell their land, then FEMA, then the, their land was assessed for a certain amount. And then they subtracted the amount it would have cost to demolish the homes. So for land that, is, that has been in their land and home that has been in their families for generations and generations since um, people were emancipated, they received checks for $200, $200. And again, um, female-headed households. And it took me back to, to knowing that, you know, that on right now, on average, a white American household has $171,000 in wealth. An African-American household has $17,000 in wealth. And but a black female-headed household has on average $5 in wealth. And when you see things like that happen, you, you, you know, and, and when you tie it back to the um, the ways that we have been capitalized upon and, and made into being capital, commoditized as people, and, and in some ways the vestiges of that continue. It just strikes me in terms of where in, in up until where we are today in terms of this intersection, where um, the fact that our that black women headed households are on average making five dollars, I mean having five dollars in wealth, means that we're more likely to live to live in the floodplains, more likely to live next to the toxic facilities. Um, and we know that all these toxic facilities are also endocrine disruptors, which is tied to our reproductive health. We know that, um, as we've talked about in the aftermath of disasters, that we are more likely to, to have homes because of, because of poor housing stock, our homes are more likely to be destroyed. And we're less likely to have homeowners insurance 
and not to mention the floodplains that we need in the context of these disasters. And then, as we also talk about, more likely to experience violence against women in the context of disasters. And so, as I kind of pivot from the all the ways that uh, again that exploitation, domination, extraction has negatively impacted us, then I, th I think about all the ways that we're rising and the the leadership that that Colette talked about. Um, the, the leadership of the, of the sisters on this panel, the leadership of folks who are leading the work on, on uh, food justice like Dara Cooper, the leadership of folks who are doing the work around the intersection with disability rights like um, Dara Baldwin, another great Dara, <laughs> and the folks who are doing work around healing justice like Huda Alkaf at, at, with Green Muslims and Tara Page. Um, the folks who are doing work um, around energy, like Moran, and um, the folks who are doing work on, on water, like like Colette, actually, and uh, folks like Monica Patrick, who is um, with uh, We the People of Detroit. So there's so much work that is rising where, where women are in leadership and taking us to to a, to a, a society and systems that actually honor the sacred, both in terms of the earth and in terms of our relationships with others. We're seeing this, this notion of regeneration and regenerative, a regenerative economy and regenerative nature and laws of our, our earth being exacted and um, being replicated um, in, the, in the work that, that women are doing across the country. So we are, we, we are seeing that we can rise above this kind of false notion of, of scarcity and lead into to the abundance that is, is truly the, the reality. When we do uh, work on, on immigration rights, we see that the U.S. is 4% of the global population, but yet 25% of the emissions that drive climate change. So we this intersection with, with globalism is when we see folks being driven from their land because the, the, the crops are drying up or because disaster is driven folks from their land. When I was in Laredo, Texas, so many of the people who are coming across the border were women or women in their families because of being driven out of those, of those situations. So we're seeing the work of, of Nidia, who is with the Holding Institute of Moreto, um, doing that work around how do we transform, how do we build the, the, uh, a, a, a nation of, that provides sanctuary and refuge for folks as opposed to putting people in cages. So I'll just wrap by saying that, um, that if there's hope in the, in the leadership that we've been talking about here, we'll continue to talk about and in this way of thinking that recognizes that that uh, cooperation, that regeneration, that uh, that caring for the sacred and deep democracy are at the core of the direction that we need to take, and the direction that women-led efforts across the country are already already taking. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Jackie, for those wonderful words. There's a lot of synergies between your remarks and Colette's remarks, and. Yeah, that focus on deep democracy is so important. Well, at this time, I'm also excited to introduce someone else that I know very well from uh, our work with the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Osprey Ariel Lake, who is the founder and executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, also known as We Can International, which is dedicated to accelerating a global women's climate justice movement. He works nationally and internationally with grassroots and indigenous leaders, policymakers, and scientists to promote climate justice, resilient communities, and a just transition to a decentralized, democratized energy future. He serves as on the executive committee for the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, which is super important. And she's also the co-director of the Indigenous Women's Divestment Delegations and actively leads Weekend's advocacy, policy, and campaign work in areas such as Women for Forests, Divestment and Just Transition, Indigenous Rights, Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal, and UN Forums. Osprey is the author of the award-winning book, Uprisings for the Earth, Reconnecting Culture with Nature. Let's all introduce Osprey at this time. Thank you so much. And um, I'm just incredibly honored to be on this panel with so many um, movement leaders, friends, and colleagues who I, I deeply love and admire. And again, thank you to the organizers of this event for all your labor and putting this together. 
And I'm here in Coast Miwok lands um, in Northern, Carol uh, Northern California. And yeah, I just really appreciate the, the acknowledgement of where we're all coming from and who has labored here before us. Um, globally, women and feminists are building grassroots solutions and climate policies to address interlocking systems of patriarchy, colonization, racism, and capitalism has been discussed. And we're doing this from you know, food sovereignty to forest protection, from fossil fuel resistance to feminist climate policies, from indigenous rights to confronting white supremacy, you know, we're, we're working to imagine and striving to build a healthy and just world we seek. And when we analyze root causes, it's clear that women experience the climate crisis with disproportionate severity, precisely because our basic rights continue to be denied in varying forms and intensities here in the United States, but all over the world. Um, but we can't in any manner talk about gender inequality without talking about the inextricable relationship to racism and the additional disproportionate impacts of the climate crisis on indigenous black and brown women as has been brought up by my colleagues. So to really confront these interlocking injustices and ecological crises, we really need coherence across policy sectors. Um, and with that, I'm gonna to go to a slideshow and it's just gonna kind of run while I'm talking. So we maybe have some images of, of what the movement looks like and what people are, what people are uh, doing and experiencing. At WeCan, we're honored uh, to be a co-founder of the Feminist Green New Deal Coalition, which is putting forward a transformative feminist agenda for climate policy and programs that center the leadership of women and strives to address the generational impacts of colonization and racism. And recently, the Feminist Green New Deal released a policy screening guide to support building feminist policies for climate justice at many levels. And, and this includes considering how care economies and gender equity need to be central to a just transition. And already there are disproportionate barriers for women and especially women of color to enter the clean energy workforce, which today is unsurprisingly predominantly male. And additionally, we're advocating that care jobs are green jobs. And that's a bigger discussion I can't get into right now, but I just wanted to stress that. And in essence, you know, in echoing, echoing my colleagues, you know, we really need to move away from our current extractive economy that is based on the exploitation of indigenous peoples, people of color, women, and the land. You know, it, it's just time to end this tragic cycle of capitalism that's based on sacrifice people, sacrifice zones, and sacrifice zip codes. And additionally, uh, we need to understand there's no such thing as a domestic climate policy from the US. Um, we can only address the worst impacts of the climate crisis if the US collaborates internationally to mitigate global warming and advances a foreign policy that puts people and their community first here in the United States and globally. And this means not catering to corporate or militarized agendas, which is really at the heart of the matter. This means a commitment to global justice and feminist principles and a recognition that the US, as, as Jackie pointed out, has been one of the world's largest historic carbon polluters. So we have to actively address responsibilities also to the global south with serious and immediate emission reductions, substantial commitments to climate finance, reparations for impacted communities, and this is the, the, the responsibility part, the accountability part that Colette Mem, uh, spoke about, and you know, full engagement in transitioning to just regenerative economies and stopping the commodification and exploitation of nature. And this is in you know, the dismantling process. We need to disrupt the historical relationships between violence against Mother Earth and violence against women. Founded on the genocidal colonization of indigenous peoples and global enslavement of African peoples, US democracy has never been fully established. And we see how structural neoliberal capitalism, colonization, racism, and patriarchy continue to undermine the dream of a full, inclusive, and operating democracy. And this is where we women are really stepping in and feminist policies are so key. Um, you know, that said, my hope remains strong as we remember the ways in which mass movements for rights and liberation have strengthened our struggles. Um, for me, I'm really encouraged by indigenous-led resistance movements, the movement for Black Lives, the Me Too movement, and many others that illustrate how people have been and are ready and willing to fight for justice. 
And I know we will not stop fighting until there is accountability, justice and liberation for all. And in this context, I think we need to uplift many initiatives such as the land back movement of indigenous peoples to manage and steward their own lands without invasion or exploitation. Indigenous peoples hold over and protect 80% of the earth's remaining biodiversity. So to accurately reflect real solutions to the climate crisis, indigenous sovereignty and solutions are really paramount. We also need reparations to communities historically excluded from Commonwealth, as my colleagues have pointed out. We need to uplift the leadership and demands of the African American and Black community, which um, you know, is, is central to justice in the United States. Globally, we need to listen to Pacific Biden leaders, as just one example, who are demanding countries like the US and those in Europe pay for the role in sea level rise. And in essence, you know, res being responsible for sinking their island nations. And it's never been more clear that we must continue our collective efforts for intersectional movement building. There's not gonna be any climate justice without racial, economic, immigrant, gender, and global justice. There will be no forward motion without all of us and all of our interlocking movements really working together at this time. And I also wanted to bring attention to a few other examples of policy work. Um, we have been advocating for the Escazo Agreement since 2016 uh, with partners in the Latin American Caribbean region or the LAC region. Um, the protection of nature, climate and biodiversity goes hand in hand as we can see with human, indigenous and women's rights. Yet largely there's been a lack of political will at the national and international levels to implement policies and frameworks that ensure the rights and protection of women land defenders. However, at the end of last year, the Escazo Agreement was fully ratified and it can provide, if we work out the details properly, a transformative multilateral agreement in the LAC region. The Escazo Agreement guarantees access rights on environmental matters and the explicit protection of human rights and environmental defenders. So it's really unique in that way. And as many of you all might know, Latin America is one of the deadliest regions in the world for land defenders. Combined with entrenched colonial and patriarchal policies, individuals threatened are often indigenous women as they stand up for their forests and water in their territories. Um, at its core, the Escazu Agreement carries the dedication and spirit of women's defense of the land. So it's a really inspiring new policy that's in play right now. And now heading far north from the discussion in the LAC region, in the Tongass Rainforest of Alaska, there's a weekend indigenous women's hub working to protect their local territories from further industrial scale logging. Uh, the Tongass is in the traditional homelands of the Tlingit and Haida and Simshian peoples. It's the largest national forest in the US and it's often been called America's climate forest due to its unsurpassed ability to sequester carbon and mitigate the climate impacts. So uh, we've conducted several indigenous women's Tongass delegations to meet with lawmakers in Washington DC to advocate for the protection of their forest homelands. And in addition to legislative actions, we are currently part of a lawsuit that was filed during the Trump administration when vital rollbacks were instituted um, that gutted in essence, the longstanding forest protections of the Tongass, which is very harmful for indigenous people whose lifeways are completely intertwined with the forest. Um, and we're currently advocating for the Tongass to be included in the nationally determined contributions coming up. Um, and heading to the Gulf South, we're really honored to collaborate with a wonderful friend and colleague, Monique Verdin from the Huma Nation, through our indigenous women and femme food sovereignty program, which uplifts indigenous women to secure and grow food and medicinal herbs for their communities and support a sustainable path toward uh, community resiliency during you know, these cascading cri crises of climate colonization and the COVID-19 pandemic. So that movement is really also important. Um, <clears throat> We've also been organizing meetings with frontline indigenous leaders uh, to meet with the Biden-Harris administration to shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline and stop line three. And some of you might, might know, and I just wanted to give a big shout out that today there's been a big action in DC organized by indigenous youth leadership. A lot of them, young women, making these demands to stop these pipelines. And <clears throat> I just have so much respect for the indigenous youth. 
And of course, we're really glad that President Biden revoked uh, the permits for KXL pipeline. Um, however, we really need uh, to show more climate leadership to stop all of the tar sands pipelines and respecting indigenous rights. Um, you know, we need policies in essence that stop fossil fuel expansion. Uh, this is a really important policy order that goes for all the pipelines, all of the development that's going on in the Gulf South. We just simply need to stop fossil fuel expansion. Um, in many indigenous communities, sexual violence against women is a grave threat perpetuated by extractive industries. For example, man camps, um, which are expansive trailer units, sometimes housing thousands of industry workers in oil and gas drilling really regions, which have resulted in extremely high rates of rape and abuse of local indigenous women and girls. So we need to have explicit legislation that respects the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And there's also so much we can learn from indigenous women about how to live respectfully um, in relationship to the natural laws of the earth through vital traditional ecological knowledge that they carry, as was mentioned earlier on um, in this uh, panel. Um, I think that we really need to include economic systems that we're learning from indigenous people that are not based on capitalism, such as Buen Vivir. These are really profound concepts having to do with deep cosmological as well as cultural, economical, and political worldviews about ways of living in harmony with communities, ourselves, and nature. And I think that this understanding of the sacredness of Mother Earth is, is something we're really highlighting in feminist movements. Um, at WECAM, we're calling on governments, financial institutions, and energy companies to uphold and implement Indigenous rights and provide real enforcement of the vital framework of free, prior, and informed consent, or FPIC. Tribes must have the right to say no to extractive industry on their lands. And we're also very aware, as everyone on this panel is, of um, how BIPOC women are more impacted by toxic pollution as um, um, earlier we were hearing from Jackie mentioned. Um, in the next few weeks, WECAN is releasing a, a report highlighting the racial and gendered impacts of the fossil fuel industry, specifically in North America, and how financial institutions are complicit in these harms and violations. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done with governments, but there's also a lot of work that needs to be done with financial institution. And the work goes on mm -hmm. in many ecosystems. Um, and I'll just close out by saying that um, for long lasting change, I think we need to recognize the transformation of the dominant social constructs that lie at the root of gender and racial inequality and the, uh, and the destruction of the earth. And so um, I believe that women are seeing this connection and are willing and able to unite across borders to challenge these systems of oppression uh, to build the world that we all know that we, we are seeking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Osprey. Once again, beautiful remarks. And I love how you just provided such a deep analysis of the connection between the devaluation of, um, of women's bodies and, and devaluation of the earth, and yet to talk about uh, empowerment and leadership. And so at this time, last but not least, I, it is my great pleasure to recommend sorry, to introduce our last two panelists. So we have Anita Nayar, who is the Director of Regions Refocus, and also Camden Getz, who is the Coordinator of Regions Refocus. So Anita has worked nationally and internationally on issues including women's human rights, economic globalization, and climate justice. She previously served as the Chief of the UN Non-Governmental Liaison Service in New York and on the executive committee of the South Face Feminist Network, Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, also known as DAWN. She currently directs Region Refocus and co-chairs the Gender and Trade Coalition. Camden Getz grew up in rural grassroots movements, especially with LGBTQ and anti-racist groups and trade unions in Wisconsin. He continues to be dedicated to working class community organizing now in Queens, New York, based in leftist anti-imperialist movements. He studied international relations and colonialism studies. Welcome, Anita and Camden. Thank you so much, Francis, and uh, my fellow panelists. It was a great pleasure to hear you and to the consortium, uh, to the team of all of you uh, for really brilliantly curating um, this series of really critical conversations that Camden and I are, are truly honored to uh, be a part of. Um, 
and to join all of you who are online with us. Uh, and we're really happy to share this allotted uh, 10 minutes between us. So Camden will speak to our work uh, to confront US economic imperialism and explore the connections that we are seeking to make with the struggles against neocolonialism and patriarchy. And what I'll do is situate this work within our wider experiences at Regions Refocus, where we have been building solidarity across regions and across movements, um, really in the struggle against the global domination of uh, neoliberalism. So while neoliberalism expresses itself very differently in different regions, including in, in the Americas, uh, where we are, um, one of the challenges really is not only to speak to our different realities, but to really illuminate our shared struggles uh, so that we can have a common conversation uh, and really find common solutions. And this is the starting point of our, the, you know, I mean, this very starting point that we start with our specific realities has led us to very different work in different regions um, and in imagining and pursuing what is uh, progressive and feminist alternatives to neoliberalism. So three examples I'd really like to share. Uh, the first is one of the most important things that our allies in the African region have pointed to is the need to go back and assert the legitimacy of the policies of the early post-colonial governments, which we can actually learn from and apply those lessons uh, to today's challenges. And this project is called Post-Colonialisms Today. And the focus is on the period from the 1950s and 60s until uh, the onset of the crisis of the mid to late 1970s. And this was really an era of when Africans exercise their agency to go beyond the colonial construct and formulate policies that were based on the knowledge of people's realities and needs. And the policies of this period really stand in complete contrast to the policies that are dictated by exploitative neoliberal finance aid and trade architecture you know, uh, of the World Bank and the IMF and the, and the World Trade Organization. So I think it's, it's very important to learn lessons um, from a period of really challenging imperialism uh, and what was, what was exercised and put in place and really what was dismantled as well um, thereafter and what lessons can we learn from that. We've published a, a series of media articles and videos um, by members of, of this project that really learn from these histories uh, and reclaims the truth of, of those experiences. And at the end of our talk, uh, we will share a link to, to this uh, article series, which is actually published with um, a media outlet called Africa as a Country. Uh, the second uh, work experience uh, that I'd like to share is uh, called the Gender and Trade Coalition. And this is a cross-regional initiative to put forward feminist trade analysis and advocacy for trade justice that really stands in opposition to um, a kind of neoliberal co-optation of women's rights, um, using women's rights as a means to open markets and expand unjust uh, trade systems. Uh, so, so this kind of South feminist analysis really challenges um, efforts to incorporate gender into a neoliberal schema. Uh, the, the third uh, work is, is our first effort in a sense to, to connect with US movements. Uh, which culminated in a report uh, called Intersecting Movements, Resisting Authoritarianisms. And, and this uh, report was based on weaving together conversations with 31 uh, feminist activists in the US and the Global South. We were really privileged to speak with uh, Colette uh, in, in her capacity at the US Human Rights Network. And the, the kinds of issues that were pointed out were, you know, included things like the patriarchal gender ideology propaganda, um, you know, uh, issues like the transnational capital flows that are really funding uh, and, and growing far right movements uh, and, and the need for really concrete internationalism in the US and in the North at large that genuinely recognizes the exploitative global economic order. And this um, last bit of, of you know, really um, concrete internationalism is what led us to deepen our work on US economic imperialism, which um, I'll pass on to Camden to speak to. 
Hi everyone and greetings from Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi territory. So first I'm gonna quickly go over some examples of framing and context in the work we're developing. And then second, dive into kind of concrete policy examples from the Biden administration, specifically from the new 2021 trade agenda. At the end, I'm also gonna drop some links in the chat to explicitly credit the movement thinkers and policy analysis influencing us. And also so you all can you know, dive deeper if you want to too. Um, so when we decided to do more work in a U.S. context, we took as our starting point to name and confront imperialism specifically. This is because we have to name the order between what's called global north, rich developed countries, and the global south, which is developing, generally formally colonized countries, as what we're confronting. That specific set of economic relationships and global institutions that uphold systems of oppression abroad and in the US and it's crushed so many attempts at alternatives. Without taking that lens, we can end up with kind of a broad global justice movement that doesn't recognize those power dynamics or even worse could be kind of subtly co-opted. Many others have of course recognized that dynamic. For example, Code Pink has a really great feminist foreign policy project which we've signed on to that many of you might be interested in and they've stressed the importance of anti-imperialist feminism as a counter to kind of growing neoliberal quote unquote feminism. Within this, our focus as Regions Refocus is really on economic imperialism specifically. Given our background, we think it's important to make connections to confront this global system of trade deals, monetary policies, climate plans, global governance institutions that strengthen capitalist oppression across the world. We were excited to connect a kind of a security focus consortium too, because there is such a stronger and longer legacy of confronting US military imperialism too, through things like critical security studies and feminist peace activism. And we can definitely make productive connections given that the military industrial complex is so central to the US economy and represents another tool to enforce economic imperialism. But still outside of you know a few examples like the WTO Battle of Seattle in 1999, we don't have as many of mass mobilization against economic imperialism specifically. But thankfully what we do have right now is a revival of the kinds of movements that were strong in the 60s and 70s, just as revolutionary post-colonial movements were strong in the global south then. Radical grassroots struggles working outside of and against the nonprofit industrial complex that insists on taking race, colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism as the bedrock of our analysis. There's a huge resurgence of kind of grassroots radical movements, especially socialist, Pan-African, indigenous, communist, trade union groups in the US that are embracing internationalism and anti-imperialism. And that means people are making very specific material connections between struggles that kind of take into account that global north-south order. And those are the kinds of movements and energy that we're looking to deepen connections with and highlight economic imperialism with. And just personally, that's how I was you know, politicized in the kinds of movements that I'm involved with. Um, but given the importance of the change of administration, we want to drill down today quickly, specifically into Biden's policies more. Even though there are definitely gains and improvements over the last administration, like rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, we can't slide into an era of complacency and co-optation as happened after Bush under Obama. We have to maintain our clarity that Biden is still an oppressor, corporate backed, a racist, a rapist, and what ultimately pushes policy change is the strength and demands of our progressive feminist movements. And for this reason, we're planning an event also at the start of May looking at Biden's economic imperialism at large, and especially his first 100 days of policymaking. But here in this space, I just wanna focus on trade specifically quickly, both for time's sake, and because we do have the administration's 2021 trade agenda, which means we can kind of move beyond the rhetoric and ideals and consultations, which Democrats are very sly with. So overall, from looking at that big 300 page document, the 2021 trade agenda, it's clear that Biden still wants to cement the dominant neoliberal free trade systems. And for decades, the system has allowed for the free movement and deregulation of US capital and actively undermined South nations options for realizing their own development priorities. In these initial months, we see possibly new free trade agreements like with Kenya, Fiji, maybe India, and really the reconsolidation of the current neoliberal trade regime, most prominently in the WTO. Three quick specific areas to see this dynamic more concretely would be agriculture, environment, and gender. Agriculture has been especially important issue in a US economic context. NAFTA remains probably the most publicly known trade deal precisely because it has reached such havoc on agriculture from crippling Mexican food systems and US working class communities to facilitating the growth of toxic American agribusiness. Now under Biden, we'll see enforced a continuation of NAFTA under the USMCA, which even center left US politicians like Bernie Sanders oppose. Moreover, in Biden's first trade agenda, the very first huge priority of his agriculture section is opening export markets for American agriculture. 
not even just growing American agriculture, but opening global South markets, which we know means deregulation, liberalization, and ultimately placing capital above planet again and maintaining the neocolonial economic order. With respect to environment, there's a dedicated trade and environment section in the 2021 agenda, but this has an almost shocking hyper-focus on fishing of all things. Why that is the main focus it seems kind of confusing, but it's really because oftentimes supposed global north concern over unregulated fishing is actually just a ploy to hamper global south small scale fishing so that northern transnational exports have more of a market. In our work, we saw the EU attempt this exact same smokescreen in another deal we're working on the post Cotonou negotiations. Um, procurement and resource extractivism is another central you know, issue in trade and environment. Um, especially because you know, with these big green transitions on the table, lithium and other you know, rare earth minerals are a key component. And in the crosshairs to obtain that lithium have often been global south and indigenous nations. And lastly, just to wrap up super quick last area, we have kind of preliminary signs of wanting, of the Biden administration wanting to call what's, what's called so-called new issues in trade, such as digital trade, which Biden wants to confront barriers to, i.e. deregulate. A particularly tricky area in this is gender and trade, which we as feminists know is not a new area, of course, but which neoliberal forces have recently kind of congealed around, starting most prominently with the 2017 declaration from the WTO Councils of Ministers, which the US didn't sign on to. What's happened since that declaration is an attempt in global neoliberal spaces to use women's economic empowerment as a Trojan horse to advance the same old agenda of liberalization, which harms working women, especially in the global south. In the new trade agenda, we see much more reference to this. In the new USTR head, we see much more reference to this. And we can really see this as a potential new area of co-optation. So that, in a nutshell, really encapsulates maybe the central problem this administration is that we have to be aware of lip service, co-optation, and really claim our space as feminists to stop gender washing, pink washing, and green washing. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Camden and Anita. That was really riveting. And uh, I think we all appreciate the critical perspectives on the current administration, uh, and also a lot of synergies with the remarks from the other panelists. So at this time, um, I have a few questions, you know, just to get the, the, the I guess, more a more critical conversation started. And then we will um, uh, soon open it up to questions and answers from the audience. And so my first question really for all of the panelists um, really revolves around this idea of the intersections of uh, gender justice, climate justice, and I would even say feminist foreign policy. I think you all did a great job of discussing the intersections of gender, race, and climate justice in your own work. But I'm wondering, um, what are your hopes and concerns regarding the mainstreaming of gender justice, climate justice, or even feminist foreign policy? And um, yeah, whoever would like to start, please go. Uh, well, this is Colette. <clears throat> if we're being honest, I think we're being honest at the symposium. Um, if we're being honest, you know, one thing that concerns me um, as a climate activist watching this women's movement over the last couple of years, I've been very concerned about the tension between um, white feminism and black radical feminism and um, how we reconcile um, as women, uh, as female identified folks, um, some of the tensions that are rooted in a lot of the things uh, we heard from the panelists, this, this colonized way of thinking, privilege, advantage, um, and things like that. Um, you know, I, I have watched um, a lot of lip service to a feminist approach for lots of things, but I've also watched um, self-proclaimed feminists really struggle uh, when it comes to honoring Black women. Um, so that anti-Black racism that seeps into the feminist space. And, you know, I, I think it's going to seep into every space because it's real, it's a reality. But I, I am hopeful that um, the feminist leaders um, from every community can, can really take this on as uh, something that we need to confront in a new climate reality where things are only going to get tougher, uh, decisions are only going to get harder, um, you know, and, and issues around scarcity and abundance are only going to get further apart. Um, I think I also um, am really hoping that um, we bring our science community with us to 
um, both innovate and, um, and create, but also to learn from traditional ecological knowledge and traditional ways of being and culturally rooted ways of, of existing and maintaining and sustaining. I feel like, um, you know, I, I hear like, a, you know, let's, let's push women into STEM. And that's great, we should push women in the STEM, but are we creating more thinkers um, uh, who, uh, you know, wanna create systems that dominate or are we um, understanding, infiltrating STEM uh, curriculum and STEM professions to allow women and female identified folks to really conjure their femininity in that space? Um, these are th th those types of solutions I'm interested in, uh, but we all know, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can assimilate any human into a mainstream system. The question is, um, can we create new systems that allow people to be uh, the best of who they are and who they come from, um, the, the best of their, of their womanhood, of their femininity, the best of their, of their race, of their culture. And th those are things that I'm really um, interested in seeing how we, how we work through, how we pan out and how we really address. So, yes. So another uh, thing that I am seeing that concerns me as we, as we, as mainstream um, efforts are underway is uh, the ways that some of the environmental organizations have used the notion of whether it's uh, a population or this, uh, or kind of uh, claiming to be in supporting gender justice by integrating a, a myopic focus on family planning toward, you know, with the justification <laughs> that it's, uh, you know, I mean, someone actually said to me that, um, basically they said, you know, well, you know, well, we, we all know that, you know, if black women had fewer mouths to feed, they would be better off. Like literally, literally <laughs> said that to me as if, <laughs> as if it was just like a normal thing to say. <laughs> um, so that's, um, these are the kind of things that are happening in some of these organizations that have taken on these population agendas as big green organizations or otherwise. Um, super concerning. Um, I was at a meeting also with uh, a funding group and it was a, the board of directors and we were talking about, I was on with, uh, anyway, we were talking about climate change and its impacts. And then as we were kind of wrapping up or doing Q and A, this person said, well, I'll name the elephant in the room. What about population? And, um, and so, and it was a white male. Um, so, uh, so then I said, well, you know, the same thing I said earlier, well, we're, the U.S. is 4% of the population and 25% of the emissions that drive climate change. So the world would be much better off if we just like locked off the United States, <laughs> you know? So if you really want to talk about, and so, cause he of course was talking about population control of black and brown bodies. And so, so this unfortunately is just, you know, something that we're seeing that for a while there was a spike and then it, then they were pushed back and then it quelled and now I'm seeing kind of a resurgence of this population environment um, uh, nexus, so to speak. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Colette and Jackie, for for your comments. And um, I I really am actually really glad that you framed this about concerns because. We all don't have a lot of time. We barely got on this call because we're all working. And it's like, you know, we take time together. For me, it's really important that it's productive and that we, you know, for me, push me, pushing myself and pushing the conversation so that, you know, we don't pretend we're not like in multiple crises, you know, climate crisis, people on the front line dying right now people not having food, people being poisoned by fossil fuel industry, like people are hurting and dying right now. So like, this is our time. And, and so thank you for helping to make it productive. Cause for me, that's really important, that urgency um, and not remaining intellectual or academic while we're also having an intellectual conversation. Um, you know, so I, I wanted just to echo 
you know, a little bit, Colette, about you, about the, the issue of white feminism, which I think is a real issue. And um, that, you know, that we really need to see, I was, I was saying in my, in my comments, you know, we cannot have this discussion of gender without race. To me, you cannot separate the two. And it's just like a, 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 a point, a, a starting point that can't be um, negotiated around. Like those two things for me have to go together in our movement. Um, for all the reasons that have been stated. Um, and then I'd like to just name and flag, like we've got to be uncomfortable. A lot of folks are already uncomfortable. So I feel like we also need to normalize being uncomfortable and that's a good thing. And, and that's a healthy thing in these conversations and we need to keep pushing that. And I don't wanna occupy a lot of time. So, you know, like getting into discussions of white supremacy, there's a great paper that I was introduced to, I don't remember the name of it right now, but it lists all these different ways that white supremacy shows up internally in our work and it's fantastic. And I'll try to get the link while we're on the call because it really highlights these issues. And then I just wanted to bring up one last point and I'll pass, pass the mic over is that, you know, of course this means centering women of color. That's the main thing in funding in leadership in every way possible. But I wanted to point out something that has been really interesting to me in, um, in advocacy work at a government level and with financial institutions, which is we're really pushing them to adopt free prior informed consent. It is international law in the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And one of the things that keeps coming up in those conversations is, you know, FPIC gives Indigenous people the right in their territories to say, no, you can't do this extraction project. No, whatever the no is. And like telling the uh, government and telling the financial institutions, no means no, we don't give consent, but they don't listen to no. So like, again, you know, where do we push this conversation of, um, you know, how we can bring in these values of a feminist approach and economic and climate justice and rights because those have to be respected. And how do we bring in legal components to ensure those rights are heard and respected? And that no starts becoming a word people can hear. I'll leave it at that. Can I just add uh, to Jackie's comments about this kind of resurgence of the neo-Malthusian links between population and, and, the, and the ecological crisis? I mean, this is like a 10 headed monster, you know, it keeps, you cut it off and it keeps coming back. And I think this is one area for genuine uh, solidarity across North South feminists, you know, I think there's been a lot of um, very uh, solid work and uh, to counter this from the South, um, because, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of framing of particularly of, um, African and Asian, uh, Sub-Saharan and, and, and Asian women as being sort of the high, so-called high fertility rates and so on. I mean, th this really has been very um, substantively challenged as you know, and I think it, it would be really powerful, I think, to bring together feminists across uh, the South with uh, communities of color here um, to really challenge this and to, to really turn this discussion of population on its head because the conversation should not be about population growth but really should be about population displacement i mean large scale displacement of communities with the climate crisis and and really this kind of rise of in infectious diseases i mean covid and co you know and and the kind of destruction of the commons so if if we can you know build some solidarity around this i think um, it's something i'd be very interested in doing it was the early part of my own politicization in as as a feminist from the south um, uh, 20 years ago and you know to, to hear that this is still an issue that mainstream environmental groups are bringing up i think it's important that we you know fight fight that uh, head on so thanks for raising it all right thank you so much everyone and so I'm hearing a theme of solidarity, like we need solidarity, that we need to have real conversations, uncomfortable conversations, uh, and that our work needs to be national and transnational. And so I guess my next question is really about 
What are the most important national and transnational policy spaces where you see the solidarity work being undertaken? Um, and then also, what's, which spaces are most critical to move climate justice, gender justice, reproductive justice forward? Well, I'm really excited about the work Osprey's leading with the feminist Green New Deal. I mean, as someone who's leading um, the red, black and green New Deal. So a, a Green New Deal conversation for black communities and participating in Green New Deal conversations for the global south and also for the broader US. Um, I, I was just really glad to see a feminist Green New Deal as part of a broader, um, a broader movement around what we need to address the climate crisis um, what we need, how we center equity and justice. Um, and it's also been like a learning space for people like me. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm a female identified person. Um, I've got a great racial analysis, but you know, the gender analysis was a place that I really needed some, some growth. And it's been really interesting to watch women and female identified folks and allied feminists um, who are not a female really come in and, and offer good analysis, good learning, good sharing. Um, good disagreements, good tension, um, things to work through. I, I really want to just honor um, Osprey's leadership and, and, and the work around that. Um, I've also seen um, uh, really great work happening um, in regional spaces. Uh, we're anchoring Gulf South for a Green New Deal uh, across these five southern states, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. And this is the red block of the deep south. Um, how do you talk about the Green New Deal here? You talk about it by um, helping people really understand their own autonomy, their own uh, self-determination, uh, their ability to redefine what a Green New Deal needs to be and what it must be for us, for the reality of the South. But it's been really great um, just in community meetings to watch folks um, really contemplate gender by um, having to do uh, gender introductions at community meetings. And I will tell you the number of conversations I have to have with community folks after that, like, why are we doing this? What's happening? But it opens a door, right? You know, it opens that it opens that conversation door because you know this is this is what's been going on. Um, and the good thing about folks who who experience oppression and are honest about it, um, they recognize they recognize oppression in its in all of its forms. And while we might have to do some uh, some of our own uh, self transformation, it's been really um, an honor to watch people get into work around addressing the climate crisis and, and, and keeping our community safe, but also going into these long-standing conversations around gender justice and, and sexuality and, and queer liberation and, and jobs and education and all of these other spaces. So um, I see a lot of the climate organizing in the US right now really um, bringing in gender as a, as a real component. I would love to see it grow, um, especially to um, the African diaspora, um, um, Central America, Caribbean, South America, I, I, Africa, the African continent. Um, I, I'd like to see uh, that growth. I think there's still a um, an imbalance into how our white allies, especially white philanthropy, sees leadership, right? And it happens in the Deep South all the time, right? You want Martin Luther King, right? You're not really paying attention to what Rosa Parks did and funding that, but that's that's what we've been inclined to think of leaders as. So um, if we start, uh, if we continue to shift the conversation around leadership, looking like our mothers, our sisters, our aunts, um, then perhaps the dollars, the resources and the research can follow that. So I'm hopeful to see that kind of change. I think we've got a long way to go, but um, I see some good movement in the right direction and it has, it gives me a lot of hope. Thank you so much for that, Colette. Did anyone else, anyone else have any thoughts on uh, the best uh, national, transnational spaces for the solidarity work or to mainstream some of these ideas? Well, I'll just jump in. Thank you so much, Colette, for those really great remarks. And, and also just to give credit to the whole coalition, the whole Feminist Green New Deal Coalition, uh, uh, spread that out to, to all of my colleagues there. Um, you know, I, I think there's a few places I think the conversation can happen. Uh, you know, one, I mean, I think these are happening at Green New Deal tables that are, I know a lot of us are involved in. Um, 
I think also, you know, I think that's a good space for this conversation to happen. I do know that a lot of times we collect, even though we don't think that the climate negotiations through the UN are going to resolve a lot, given that governments are moving so sluggishly without the climate emergency or climate justice framework we need. It is a place where we collect our movements together. I think it's another place uh, to uplift uh, feminist leadership there and to, to continue to familiarize people with our principles. So I think, you know, every time those cops happen, we have another opportunity. Um, you know, we have this big uh, conversation going on with Biden's uh, climate summit on Earth Day. There'll be a lot of conversation going on there. So I think we need to use these international and large national um, spaces to keep pushing this agenda forward and, and in all the different ways that we have um, in our own movements. Um, and it's one of the reasons that we're putting out these different policy screening tools so we can get people familiar with the language and get critique back so that it improves. Um, the last thing I wanted to say that kind of internalizes, Francis, your conversation a little bit, because I know you're, you know, wisely directing us to where these conversations happen, but something I've learned from some of the Black feminists that I'm so honored to have met with um, in Kenya is um, they have this remarkable conversation about the site of where conversations happen. And they can say it better than me, but just to give it a, a taste of it, they were talking about, let's have conversations in sites of struggle, like you know all the frontline struggles we're engaged in, but let's also step back and have these conversations in sites of healing and an imagination so that we can separate out our roots, our ancestry, uh, our knowledge in our ancestral roots and have that conversation as well as placing the conversation in the site of struggle. And it really provides a different framework so that we can bring our inspiration and our healing to the site of struggle and not always be in this defensive mode, which you know we need to be in. You know, I see it sort of as the sword in the rose. You know, we've got to be where is out there fighting, but we also need this healing time so we bring that knowledge to the site of struggle. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Thank you. Yeah, that was absolutely beautiful. And I love that you touched on healing. I've been thinking a lot myself about what does healing justice look like? And I think a, a lot of folk on this panel have great ideas. Uh, I think at this time, because we have a lot of questions uh, from our audience that maybe I will open it up to um, ev everyone else so they can ask, get their questions in. And at this time, I'll actually turn it over to Melissa. Hello, everyone. Um, I am so grateful for everyone's contributions today. It was incredibly interesting. And that is the comments coming in from, uh, from the Q&A as well is just a huge thank you for everyone's, um, for everyone's remarks. So one of the questions from the audience actually has to do with um, the relationship between sort of decolonized, desecuritized approach to environmental justice and movements to desecuritize issues like violence prevention and transitional justice and sort of where you see those relationships coming up in this conversation. Um, this is Colette, I, I'll say, um, I don't know anything, I don't have stats, I'm not one of those people. So here's, so here's what I know. Um, these, these stressors, these traumatic moments, these climate disasters wreak havoc on female identified people. And it doesn't happen, uh, it, it happens in the immediate hit, of course, because of all of the things we've heard, um, especially what Jackie was saying, if, if, if you're a poor black woman, where you live is going to really impact how the disaster hits you. That's true. On top of that, what I remember, especially in the Katrina and BP recovery is the, um, you know, we offered free legal services in, in the aftermath of climate disaster. And we don't, you know, we'll do these basic uh, legal uh, procedures sometimes, but the amount of violence against women, um, the amount of, um, it's not just divorce, it's violence, violence-induced divorce. It's um, 
you know, um, you know, I remember this one case that I had of this couple who they, you remember Katrina wiped out everything, right? So we're not talking about like a, you had a bad day and then tomorrow you go live somewhere. Like everything was down, like there was nothing. And so people were living in situations that were ones you never thought you'd have to live in, including people who are divorced or divorcing, having to live in places with the person's new person, you know, having to live in places with many men. I mean, the immigrant labor that came in post Katrina and the, the amount of violence on immigrant women was just appalling to me. And they had no real rights, you know, they hadn't established themselves uh, lawfully in this country yet. And so, I mean, just the silence that happens, the, 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 the climate disaster induces an increase on violence against women and female identified bodies. And that's just in the home. Because if you watch the violence that happened by the police departments, um, by the schools, you know, one of my first cases was um, a case of a bus driver, um, uh, you know, beating a Katrina kid who had mental, um, who was mentally disabled. But, you know, they, the, the hate that came with these New Orleans kids coming to your, you know, your town. I mean, it, 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 is, it is amazing to me that there has been a lack of that conversation. And I heard the same thing with COVID. These folks who are forced to now stay in homes, you're seeing violence and, and child abuse at these levels that no one's talking about. And so um, I think we have to be honest about the fact that increased extreme weather, these climate impacts are going to increase violence against women. And we're going to have to absolutely um, ramp up on the protections, but there's some level of mental health and healing and, tra and trauma management that we're gonna have to create uh, because there's, you know, there's so many people a system can help. At some point, society has to shift itself. And I think we're gonna need our brothers and sisters and the men in our life to understand that the trauma is real. The climate disaster is real. The economic impact of this thing and not knowing how you're gonna live tomorrow, that, that's real. Taking it out on the nearest, female identified person to you is not acceptable. Here's how you handle it. And that's the thing, you know, we go from demonizing one to demonizing the other. There's no solution in here. There's no one really addressing. So anyway, I'll stop there, but I'll just say, I see those things connected. It's not something I would have picked up on, but it is something I saw with my own eyes in, in these disaster impacts. Thank you so much for that, Colette. Um, I think that that's so important. A lot of folks don't think about that. And it's been on my mind a lot, especially as we've been um, in this pandemic lockdown, the rise in um, domestic violence. So thank you. Uh, there's a question from an attendee who wants to know, how do we take steps to acknowledge and name imperialism when it can be pretty easy to slide into the white savior colonizer role when reaching out in international policy spaces? Are there any specific steps you can recommend to avoid these patterns when working internationally, especially when you're based in the global north? The, you, do you want to start on this, Anita, or should I? I feel like it's a bit our wheelhouse. Sure, maybe. go for it, and we can okay. both chime in, please. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that there's, I mean, there's a couple layers to that because it's both, there's both the international element, but then the also like quote unquote domestic too, where at least in our work, it's a very different basis because of the, the origins of it aren't, you know, us going out into other spaces and trying to recruit people or push a certain agenda, right? It's being invited into or on the basis of pre-existing relationships and politics, right? There's a whole different configuration that I think has to be kind of the starting point. Because I think that that can often times across any power dynamic, really easily lead to that if you're going into spaces trying to you know build something in a, in a sort of artificial way. Um, I guess that would be an initial starting point. And the other point too that I just add is that it's not even just you know a question of the international white savior thing, but that's an issue quote unquote domestically as well, right? Um, and as, as we've been saying, you know we're trying to build connections across groups in the US and the South that are radical, anti-racist, indigenous, pan-Africans, all that that kind of break multiple power dynamics at once 
I'd say is also a starting point of where you have to begin. Um, I guess the last little point I just add to is like confronting it, global imperialism, right? Especially US imperialism doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you going into other regions and doing that. Part of what our recognition with this was is that being in the power base of global capitalism and imperialism means there's things we can confront like next door, right? Us based in New York, down the street from Wall Street, center of global destruction and imperialism, right? And you see many great anti-imperialist movements that take that into recognition. One example that I always like of a way to concretely confront economic imperialism is the boycott divestment sanctions movement, right? And they've really learned a lot of those bread and butter tools. So one thing they did specifically on this front was they blocked Israeli shippers during a particularly brutal attack on Palestine, just physically with their bodies in a US port, right? And that's not about, you know, taking some whole journey into Palestine and taking pictures or whatever kind of savior complex thing. That's recognizing that the US is what is enabling you know, Palestine, uh, Palestinian oppression and Israeli settler colonialism. And there's many other examples from that, that kind of, you see the nexus of power in your backyard and figure out how can you, there's a great quote from Bayard Rustin. They said, you know, you're trying to make things unworkable is what we're trying to do. There's the gears happening of imperialism, right? But define us, we got to put a wedge in it and stop it from turning. Um, there, that's my bit, if anyone mm -hmm. else. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think that was beautifully said. I would just add an experience that um, in working on policy issues that affect the global south, the voices that uh, are most prominent in the US are the larger international NGOs uh, that are based in, in the US and but, but are disconnected from struggles um, of movements in the US um, and are funded to do um, this work that um, Cameron was speaking of, of from the orientation of, you know, providing a, a set of solutions for the world or for the for the South. And that's been, you know, I mean, there was a period where I had the patience to sort of fight against that mode. Now I just I don't even have the patience to even engage with it. You know, it's and that's that's really it, you reach that place where, you know, you, you, you can't even hear their arguments of, um, you know, that, that somehow the solutions need to come from the South um, and, and that if only those solutions came from the South, there would be solidarity in the North. Well, there isn't even an understanding of why. Uh, it's not as though the uh, South or, or communities of color and so on don't know what the solutions are. It's that there are systems in place to prevent those from being articulated, from being on the agenda. So it's, it's, it's this kind of, a uh, twist of, 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 um, of the power as though it is shifting to the South, as though is, it is shifting to communities of color when actually, you know, who is getting the funding to, to, to continue doing this kind of, who has this kind of staff size and the kind of analytical uh, power base to even produce reports and all these things. It's, it's stacked very much um, uh, to a certain form of, of an NGO that, um, uh, not to discard all NGOs, but a certain form uh, that is consolidating a certain kind of power and, and, and disseminating a certain analysis that we do need to challenge. So that is, that is part of um, the, the structural constraints, I think, as, as within civil society that we face of, of building this kind of solidarity and, and a genuine internationalism in the North. Okay, I'm gonna um, just jump in with the next question, but if anyone has anything further that they wanna say, you can always go back and answer a prior question. Um, but this one, and sorry, I didn't mention, the first question is from Julia Canny. So this next question is from Anara Sharzo. And um, they ask, what do you think about raising awareness regarding climate change and structural racism within the education sector? Um, the possibility of introducing new subjects in schools on topics of gender justice, sustainable de development, and climate crisis. And I would just broaden that question a little bit to ask about the relationship between that and education policy um, and where some of those connections might come in. I guess education policy or initiatives. Either way, and I forget who mentioned it, but I did hear someone at an earlier point in their presentation 
uh, just talking about sort of the educational component of it. Um, well, I'll just jump in just to, to keep the conversation going here, but please, anyone else. Um, um, and I know, Francis, this is also an area, you know, that you're very engaged in. So maybe even though you're moderator, you could change hats and jump in as well, too, if you wanted to comment. Um, I, I want to just talk about education generally, um, although I think the question was more specific for educational institutions. But, um, you know, look, we, we need to radically change everything from our textbooks to, you know, having anti-racism. Uh, education for instructors. I mean, I think it's just another area that needs, uh, you know, radical development as we do structurally in governance in the financial sector. I mean, you know, we can't have our kids being brought up on some of these textbooks, you know, that are, are filled with patriarchal colonized racist views. Let's just start there. And, and, and the, this, is, this is a systemic problem and also involves change of worldview. And, you know, these are big long-term changes that are going on at every level of society. So I, I think that's something that we need to do. And then I'll talk very specifically about, um, you know, sort of a advocacy educational, if you will, um, component of work that we're doing, uh, both with governments, but also with um, financial institutions. Um, and it really has to do with, you know, the extractive industries and how they are bearing down on particularly uh, um, women and, and individuals who are women identified and, and uh, you know, land, food, water, forests. And um, one of the things that we see in these engagements with the government and engagements with financial institutions, I'm talking about global banks, um, talking about uh, large um, asset managers and insurance companies who are funding a lot of these projects that we're talking about when we're talking about extraction um, and we're talking about the financial sector and what they're funding. Um, you know, there's a huge educational gap. And so one of the things that I really believe in and we have found to be really effective is to ensure that black, brown and indigenous women have access directly to uh, meeting with um, policymakers, decision makers, and with, you know, top level management in financial institutions. Because what I've witnessed is a huge gap between people who have the funds, who are financing and investing in destruction of people and planet and communities, um, as well as those making decisions in government, and the grassroots, actual people, people are hurting, people who are in communities, mothers, children, um, you know, people who are being harmed. And that conversation has been quite transformative to bring those, the, the pairing of those sets of communities together, because there's nothing like hearing directly from people who just, you know, lost a loved one or has cancer or who, whose community is laden with cancer historically, who, you know, we could go on and on with the harms, uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women, um, the rape, of destruction of land and looking into the eyes of the people who are making those decisions and saying, this is a human rights issue. This is a human life issue. And when you're looking at your little boxes, making decisions about where you're financing and who you're financing or what government policies you're making, you know, you need to keep in mind that there's real human beings behind this while you're sitting in your building 20 stories high up, checking off boxes. And that conversation of, of being in the same space, the bodies being together, the voices being together is very transformative. And I think that kind of education needs to go on um, at many other levels where we have direct conversation, where frontline communities have direct access to financiers, to government officials, because we can't continue as we are. We have to change the dialogue and we have to look for places where radical conversation can go on. I just wanted to quickly chip in a little resource on the education question. Just this panel, one of my comrades was on who's a public school teacher on being like an anti-imperialist teacher with several other teachers. So I'm just gonna put that in the chat for everyone. 
Thank you, Camden, for that resource. Yeah, um, for the sake of time, I won't go into a lot of detail, but yeah, I think it's important that we look at education policy as uh, climate policy. And um, there's some great resources created by the Alliance for Climate Education, for one. And also many of the um, uh, grassroots communities, they engage youth. It might not always be in a formal classroom, although it is, but they definitely engage youth and um, youth activism is really important when we talk about climate justice, gender justice, and reproductive justice. Uh, so I had uh, two questions. I'm oh, sorry, Jackie, yeah. I just want to point out, put in the chat, a uh, resource guide we put together around teaching intersectionality and environmental justice in the classroom. And I'm also going to find, we have a youth in college toolkit on environmental and climate justice that highlights some of the great youth-led work that's happening from groups like Uprose, Mycelium Network, and so forth. So I'm going to put that in the chat in a minute as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Yeah, those are great resources um, from the NAACP. Uh, actually, Jackie, I had a, there was a question for you in the chat. Um, could you provide maybe briefly further information about, I think it says the FEMA declaration of the land as a floodplain. So that's, yeah, that's a quick question. Yeah, sure. And I will also put a couple of articles on that in the chat as well. But long story short, there was a concern. So I, I, I mentioned that, that, that folks could have their land taken and they were given $200 in compensation after they had been in their family for generations. But there was a concern that somehow there was something else afoot that drove that other than, because A, the fact that it's never, there's never been a flood there in, in the 200 plus year history of the community, yet it was declared a floodplain. And B, that after these properties were sold, you know, were kind of gone into the FEMA buyout for $200. After that, people went in and assessed the land again and it had quadrupled in value after it had been and so there's a notion that there's some kind of development that's trying to happen and that it's another kind of land grab um, situation but as a result of it being declared a floodplain uh, not only you know are these the folks kind of feeling pressure but they're feeling pressure because they, there's no running water they don't have uh, services like garbage pickup all the things that we're used to having you know, from paying, you know, paying taxes and so forth, because it's an unincorporated area, then it's under the obligation of the of the Dallas County, it's kind of annexed by Dallas County. And because it's a floodplain, they have justification for, to not provide any of those services. So there is a lot that is um, that's happening there. So I'll again put a couple of chat, a couple of links in the chat, but we, um, we have what we're calling the Sand Branch Liberation Plan to, to address the myriad issues that are going there on there and um, and make sure that Sam Brinks is in a place of self-determination rather than having all these things happen to them. They're actually in the driver's seat in terms of their future. So stay tuned on that. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that, Jackie. Uh, and then Melissa, I didn't know if there was a question you wanted to ask. Um, I wasn't sure if you were pointing to the capitalism one, but I am happy to, to go ahead and ask it or you can. Um, so someone, and there are actually several, so I'm not sure exactly which one, but someone, uh, Alden Ringheiser asked, is it possible to create a future of climate justice within the framework of capitalism? No. Oh, I didn't know. Do we need more? Or shall we? I thought that was a great and direct question. I say no, Alden. <laughs> I think that's perfectly a perfectly acceptable answer to, to give. Um, Francis, did you have another question that you were thinking of or was that the one? Yeah, so as a follow up to that, I think there was someone else in the chat who was saying, you know, like, I'm a business major. So like, how do I contribute to the cause, considering, you know, the type of you know, the program they're in. So maybe that's a follow up question to the capitalist question, like, how do folk engage when maybe they're, you know, they're in these departments or disciplines which are promoting capitalist accumulation? I can chip in a little thing on that, um, especially for I saw they were in marketing. And I mean, I have some great comrades that are 
revolutionary communists and their day job is in marketing, right? We have lots of things that random working class people, you know, do as their day jobs. I guess I would just encourage them to think through like that's still a skill set at the end of the day and find some other type of collective if you're not able to find it through your work and you know that you have these sentiments that might be you know outside of academia and the nonprofit industrial complex even and CEO can use some of those same skills right you might have learned in marketing and business how to like design good flyers and outreach materials how to manage social media well those are things that grassroots struggle needs too so if you're able to find those groups in your area in your community that are explicitly anti-capitalist anti-white supremacy, anti-patriarchal, and then put your skills to work, you know, for those collectives and come in through a humble place and kind of do that, that basic work. I think that, yeah, you'll, you'll find out, you know, where you need to go. I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And I don't want, you know, I hope no one feels guilty. Like we've all been educated to believe that this system works. And the truth is it works exactly like it's supposed to work, which is why we see the disparities that we see. And I just go back to one of Osprey's comments earlier in her remarks about being uncomfortable. There's no way we're going to get to a solution still trying to be comfortable, right? How do I make sure my degree is still relevant? How do I make sure I keep my wealth and help other people? How do I make sure that when I upset this, I don't upset my parents, my family, my community? It's not going to happen like that. If we're going to actually transform this, some if un, discomfort is the least you can offer to the movement, the very least that you can offer to the movement. As much as you want to offer your talents and your money, what we really need is for those of us who have the privilege to access higher education to understand what discomfort is really going to mean and what it's really going to take. And some of that discomfort is going to be unlearning what you learn to take in the right information that has been restricted and held from you. And that, I didn't even used to believe that. I was a corporate lawyer. Let me, let me be clear. Like I, I, I did not come to this with like some revolutionary mind. I came to this because when you, when you are forced to see a reality, you can either take the red or the blue pill. You can either act like you didn't see it, or you can come into a reality that is going to cause challenges. And, to, and, and, and what's the answer if no capitalism? Because that's always the question. If we don't have capitalism, what are we going to have? Well, now is the time for big ideas. Now is the time for innovation. Now is the time to actually think about hard questions. And I think that's what the symposium has done. So one more time, shout out to just the conversation here. Um, but this is the time. The time is not to figure out how to continue on with the system that exists. It is bad, it is corroded, it is, it is damaged, it is broken. We have to dismantle this, it will be messy. But we have to build something else, something more beautiful. You know, I live in the swamp. There are beautiful things coming out of the mud every day. Um, and that's really what, how we're going to have to think about this. It's not that we can't get to beauty and love and healing and, and, and good. Um, but we have to really acknowledge that all of us, every single one of us with letters behind our name and getting letters behind our name are part of a particular class of people. Who, for whom the system is made. And we're gonna have to actively decide to not engage in that system, not uphold that system, not support that system, even with our good intentions. We're going to have to see that something else is needed. So I'm still no on capitalism. I was just trying to put a little sugar on it, you know, a little honey, make it go down. Uh, Colette, I, I love what you said so much. I love all of it. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I really, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, we're, we're navigating contradictions. We're in a system and we're dismantling it at the same time. And it's very personal. It's daily decisions and it's decisions at the level of some of us running organizations and how we get our funding. I mean, it's just permeated everywhere and how do we survive? And, you know, again, uh, because I was going to the, the bank and government, uh, conversation just to, to, continue, to continue that theme. One of the things we always ask them, as I ask myself every day, is like, you know, what are we giving up? What are we going to be uncomfortable with? Because nobody wants to give. You know, if you're in the comfort zone and you're the privileged, like, yeah, this is that question. And it's very personal and it's very deep. And we have to keep pressing in on that. And I, I wanted to, to, to also highlight, like, we don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. 
Um, I was mentioning earlier about Buen Vivir, you know, which is concepts coming out of the global south from indigenous people or Sumac Kausai from the Quechua people. And there's many of them in many communities, if we go back to our own ancestors, about living in a way where we have different values. It's a worldview change where, you know, it's not how much money you have or GDP. I think we have to seriously look at these economic structures that value friendship, value creativity, value our healing, value our spiritual wealth. Um, in some indigenous language, the word for wealth actually means your relationship with nature. Like how wealthy you are is actually how much knowledge you have about the place you live and the trees and the plants and the animals. Like our whole definition of wealth is corrupted. So, um, you know, we're not talking about things that happen overnight, but we've got to get busy now. And it's, you know, a balance between what we're willing to be uncomfortable with, you know, risks that we have to take at a personal level and support each other to do that. While at the same time realizing like, there's a lot to value that's not about money. And, and how do we do that and encourage that and encourage each other to, to see wealth in a very, very different framework? Thank you so much for that, Osprey and Colette. Those are uh, some really great reminders. And I think that resonates with a lot of folks because we really are navigating contradictions on the daily. And so with that being said, unfortunately our time together is almost up. So at this time, I would love for everyone to provide perhaps some brief closing remarks. And if you could maybe reflect on uh, what does it mean to center these communities that we all come from and that we hold dearly, you know, indigenous peoples, women, BIPOC folk, queer communities. And also how do you fortify your nerves, guard your sanity when you're you know, doing this work on the daily. So yes, everyone, please, uh, I'd love to hear from everyone your closing remarks and just a reflection on how do we center the voices that need to be centered and how do you, you know, take care of yourself and others? Well, maybe we'll go in the order we started. Um, I was just finding a reason to talk first. Um, I, I think, um, you know, how do, how do we stay in this? Well, you know, I think this is really where spirit and culture and family and community come in. Um, you can't do this work by yourself. And um, I'm so grateful for um, just coming from a loving family and a supporting community. Um, uh, and, um, you know, people who, um, who try to understand even when they don't understand, right? They really, they, they see your passion, they see, they see your commitment and, and, they, and they support you. So I think um, it's time to just sort of look around to the communities that we do have and just thank them for the support that they give to us. Um, you know, I think we <laughs> we have to pull we have to pull together now. It's a it's a million people out there I really don't enjoy, and I got to stand with them on the front line now. Um, I've got to put ego aside. I've got to put my feelings um, healed, um, but a little to the side. I've got to focus on the task at hand um, and remember that we don't get out of this without everybody. Um, and, and that's really what this is gonna take. It's, it's, it's not we get out of this with just our friends who think like we do. That's not how this is gonna work. Take it from your friends working in the deep south. It's not gonna work like that. Um, it's going to be how do we figure out how to work together despite our differences, despite our differing opinions. And I think this comes back to, to listening. I think it comes back to um, things we learn as children in the South, which is, um, you know, sometimes your role is um, to listen. <laughs> sometimes you don't have enough um, to, to lead just yet. Um, but if you listen and if you're around and if you're engaging, I liked what Candom said, bring your, bring, your, bring your powers to the movement. Um, you can learn lots of things and then it will be your time. Um, and when it is your time, don't make excuses about why you can't and why you shouldn't. When it's your time, we need you to step up and step in. So with that, I'll just say um, deep gratitude to um, all of you who stuck around for two hours. Um, this climate movement is real. It is global. We need you. We need everyone who can read, write, and, and analyze uh, to join us. And I'm excited to see everyone here on the front lines.
All right, maybe Jackie. Yeah. Yes, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I forgot the, the order there. I was letting that sink in. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so I would say that just in terms of that, that the second question in terms of what's sustaining that really also answers the first question is for me, what's been sustaining has been, as Colette said, being in, in connection and being in community with, with, with folks on the front lines. Like what, like while I am devastated when I visit a place like Sand Branch, what, what lifts me up is also working in a place like Gulfport, where we first started working there and it wasn't the work of the NAACP branch wasn't necessarily around environmental and climate justice. And then now they've done a local food project. They've been active on setting down their coal fire power plant. They're doing work on coastal resilience and protection. They're doing work on disaster equity. And so now being able to, to then uh, to then be inspired by the work that has grown in one place that you've worked in and then be able to, to make a linkage. And again, it's like going back to all about connection and community to another place that, that is in its infancy and trying to get go down a similar path. And so being able to be that servant to that process and to be a servant to the process and to be a, a learner in the process is what both inspires me in terms of the leadership of the local community and it keeps me going because it feels like it's, it's gratifying to, to, to be able to to be a part of, of the change that we need to see in the, in the world. So that, that's what I would say. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much um, to all the panelists. It's just really been an honor to be here with you, really. And thank you to everyone who organized. I feel really honored to be part of this conversation and, and Francis for your leadership in, in uh, facilitating. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think I'll just agree with everything that's been said so well already by Colette and Jack. You know, it's about our relationships and our community that keeps us going. and. I know for me, I, I would just say that it, I feel incredibly humbled by the, the women that I'm very honored to work with on the front lines. And it puts everything really super into perspective and where my energy goes. Like, I'm really aware of, you know, the women we work with in the Amazon whose lives are being threatened or have already been murdered. Um, I'm aware of the illness. We know we just did this re report. I was sharing this about to be released on on women from the Gulf, um, uh, a lot of uh, Black and African American communities, Indigenous peoples, Latinx women, you know, like, I feel like it's important to not let it overwhelm us, but like, I take that in, you know, it, it brings tears to my eyes. It's, it's like, I don't want to be separate from it, because we're all human beings. We're all together and I'm not into this oneness thing. I'm very, I'm very troubled by we're all in this together. We're not into this together evenly. Yeah, we're all in this, but we're not into the, in this together evenly, all these struggles. And like, you know, it's really important that we allow ourselves to feel it and to grieve and to let that fuel us and not push it away. You know, this pain's just gonna keep coming, but the beauty's gonna keep coming too. And we're not gonna feel the beauty and we're not gonna know what the hell to do if we don't feel what's happening on the front lines and participate. So that's that's what teaches me. And I'm very humbled to be able to, to do anything that I can and to learn from all my frontline sisters and from everyone here. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm next. Um, just to say I similarly very um, inspired by just being in community with all of you on this call um, with the panelists and uh, hearing at least some voices from those who are joining us online. I think what is most sustaining is the comradeship for me and being um, very deliberate about uh, making that the day-to-day -day work uh, to build uh, that solidarity and build the comradeship and, and, and work in alliance um, 
being also very clear about the timeline and the urgency um, of, of whether it's limiting uh, global, global warming or, or, or really challenging this kind of imperial uh, neoliberalism. Um, I think it's, there, there's a, a time as, as, uh, as Colette said of, of doing it now. Um, and the urgency of that is, is what is driving. Um, I think there's so much that needs to be done in, in the US to really uh, build this kind of internationalism and consciousness and really um, um, not fall into uh, a trap of thinking that somehow the US state is going to lead us um, uh, and lead the world. And there is, um, you know, a very deep uh, imperialist <laughs> um, approach that needs to be challenged. And, um, you know, we need to take historic uh, responsibility for the, for the historic and continued uh, climate crisis and, and the damage that the U.S. has done. And that really, that really does mean um, addressing climate reparations and really addressing um, you know what 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 are the listening to the demands of, of of the south and really ensuring that we're not with potentially more climate finance we're not you know putting in place further liberalization of finance or 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 you know ignoring the kind of uh, military industrial complex that actually is driving uh, the us as the largest polluter so i think we do need to confront uh, U.S. imperialism head-on, uh, and also really build comradeship across the U.S. and the South um, to listen to the particular realities and 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 the common and shared struggles. Um, and just to chip in on my bit, I just reiterate that now is really a time to be especially cautious of co-optation by neoliberal capitalist forces and to maintain that clarity that we've been having in our politics. We have this whole kind of range of these subtle technical policy threats coming up that we have to insist on the alternatives to, you know, on gender, we're going to see this Trojan horse of insisting on reducing tariffs, supposedly for women's economic empowerment, when those tariffs fund social support programs for care work relief, we have the green transition coming up, and we need just terms of export, when we have procurement for the Green New Deal that can facilitate the structural transformation and development priorities of South and Indigenous nations. And on agriculture, we have to stop this deadly combination of liberalization and subsidies that has wreaked havoc and defend those development alternatives like farmer support programs, price floors for basic goods, restricting imports when the US floods Mexican agriculture markets, things like that. And so just to wrap up, I would just reiterate that Bayard Rustin quote that we have to take responsibility as activists in the US and the global North and make imperialism unworkable. Thanks everyone. Well, thank you so much. Um, you all have shared so much information, so much wisdom. We've run out of time, but thank you so much. Everyone is just so grateful. And at this time, I will actually turn it over to Carol for uh, the closing of this program. Well, thank you so much, Francis. Um, Francis, Colette, Jackie, Osprey, Anita, Camden, it has really been wonderful to have you in this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for entering this conversation with so much honesty, complexity, um, creativity, and spirit. It has, it has just been a tremendous combination. Um, and thank you as well to all of the people who have um, hung out with us through this time. Uh, again, some people were asking about could they um, have this conversation available to their friends. I think there's information in the chat. Our website is genderandsecurity.org. You can find it here, I, uh, there. I also wanna say that um, this conversation will continue in a different way over the next two weeks. There'll be two more webinars and maybe in particularly to say in relation to the conversation about capitalism, um, that the one two weeks from now is called New Economic Paradigms for Peace and the Planet, Intersectional Feminist Perspectives. So all you need to do is wait two weeks and you'll have all the answers. No, but a lot of really good creative conversation, which I think will be really terrific. So um, 
And uh, yeah, so we'll try to live up to the quality of this one. So again, just um, I, I want to, you know, move forward with all of you with thanks and solidarity for this important conversation and look forward to many other ways of working with you again. So thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.